Now we're going to talk about how skeletal muscle cells are electrically excitable. So that's one of those, uh, we talked about skeletal cells and how they have the ability, they're excitable cells. Um, they are, they have the ability to conduct an electrical impulse. So let's talk about how that happens. All right, so the, this is where, you know, it may seem very overwhelming and it's a lot, but I'm gonna, we're just gonna walk through each one of these slides and slowly talk about how skeletal muscle cells are excitable. And this will help not only with muscle physiology, but also with nervous system physiology as well, because neurons of nervous tissue, neurons are also excitable cells, okay? All right, so w what is a membrane potential? A membrane potential is due to the unequal distribution of ions just near the plasma membrane. And then if we think about the word polarized or polarity, it means something is different at one side versus the other. And so here, when we're talking about a membrane potential, we're going to be talking about how there's a different distribution of ions along the outside versus the inside of the plasma membrane. All right, so there are different ions, different ion gradients, and an equal distribution of ions near the plasma membrane. And those ions that we're really going to focus on are sodium and potassium. And if you remember, what are ions? Ions are atoms, like an atom of sodium or an atom of potassium, right, that hold a charge. And that's because they differ in the number of uh, electrons versus protons. So I'm just bringing back some of the previous stuff from the first three chapters of this book and as to why that background, that general biology stuff is important now. Ions have are atoms of a particular element that hold a charge. Why do they hold a charge? It's because whatever number of protons they have in, the, their, in their nucleus, the number of electrons are different, right? And remember, protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. So if an ion it has a negative charge, that means it has more electrons than it does protons. If an ion has a, and those are called anions, remember? If an ion has a positive charge, that means it has more protons in the nucleus than it has electrons in those outer shells meaning it has a net positive charge. Those are called cations. The reason why I'm going all of the, uh, over that stuff again is because you know at the end of the semester there is a comprehensive final, and so I'm trying to bring up concepts from previous chapters that will help you understand this stuff right now. All right, so that's what a membrane potential is. Unequal distribution of ions near the plasma membrane. So a thin layer of negatively charged ions in the cytosol. So in, so I want y'all to get this straight now. Just in your head, know that at a resting state, right, when a cell is just resting, not being excited, when a cell is resting, the inside is going to have negative char a negative charge, whereas the outside will be positive, okay? So a thin layer of negatively charged ions in the cytosol, so inside, and a thin layer of positively charged ions on the outside. So see image, let's go to this slide real fast. Here's our phospholipid bilayer. Remember the uh, hydrophilic heads are oriented towards the extracellular fluid and the cytosol or the intracellular fluid. Those fatty acid tails are oriented towards the inside because they are hydrophobic. That creates the barrier between the extracellular fluid and the cytosol. And just along the, pla the outside of the plasma membrane, we see these positive charges. And the reason why, like, and on the inside, it's just this thin layer of negative charges. So the outside, the extracellular fluid along the plasma membrane is positive. The intracellular fluid along the plasma membrane is negative, okay? And um, the reason why it's just shown just along the outside and the inside of the plasma membrane is because if you venture away from the plasma membrane, then, so away from the sarcolemma, the positive and negative ions are in roughly equal numbers. So if we venture a little bit out here, it's gonna be neutral. 
little bit in here, more neutral. But just along the plasma membrane, we have this unequal distribution of charges, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. All right. Okay, so separation of charges creates an electrical gradient, represents a source of potential energy. What that means is that this great, this electrical gradient, the fact that we have a polarized membrane, positive outside, negative inside, this represents a driving force because everything wants to reach equilibrium. That's just a concept true across all biology. Everything wants to reach some sort of equilibrium. So this separation of charges represents a potential to do work in the form of an electrical impulse, all right? So this separation of charges creates an, creates an electrical gradient. More positives outside, what would they wanna do? Follow their gradient towards the negative. More negatives on the inside, they would wanna follow their gradient to the outside. And that represents a potential energy. When, bar when there's a barrier separating, uh, when the barrier separating those ions is removed, right? So if we were to just remove this phospholipid bilayer quickly, then positive would be drive this way, negative would drive this way until it was equally distributed, okay? And when those ions move, it creates a flow of electrical charges, right? And that potential energy becomes a kinetic energy. Now, am I gonna ask all of the, you know, the specifics of all of this stuff? I'm really trying to set the stage for you understanding muscle physiology, but it is important to understand what, where are the positive charges, where are the negative charges, and that the, this is an electrical gradient that these ions will want to follow, okay? Um, and that separation of charges represents a potential to do work. The electrical gradient can therefore be referred to as an electrical potential. So if you ever hear, you know, electrical potential, it just means an electrical gradient that is a potential energy that could be converted to kinetic energy if those ions are allowed to follow their gradients. Okay? So what is a key here? What is a membrane potential? It's a membrane potential is the unequal of distribution, the unequal distribution of ions near the plasma membrane, where more positives are on the outside versus negatives on the inside. All right, and I already talked about this: the fact that if you venture a little bit farther out here or in here, it'll be about electrically neutral. These charges are really just along the plasma membrane. So membrane potential, or that unequal distribution of charges, okay, of a cell is, is the electrical potential across the plasma membrane, and it's measured in voltage. So voltage is the difference in charge potential between two points. So if you put an electrode on two, at two different points, the difference in the charges between those two points, that's the voltage. So, and I, I'm not going to ask you for the definition of voltage. This is just to help you to understand whenever we talk, if you hear resting membrane potential is blank millivolts, that's the unit of measure and it just represents the, the charge difference between the outside and inside of the cell. All right. And whenever you see a reading, so right here, so potential across the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, is quite small, so it's measured in millivolts. So that is a unit, small m, big V, millivolts, and it's one one thousandth of an actual volt. So it's a small, small change in voltage. Resting membrane potential, so resting meaning the sarcolemma is not being excited, it's just resting. Okay, so resting membrane potential is the electrical potential across the sarcolemma of a resting muscle fiber, so not actively contracting. And it measures negative 85 millivolts. So the fact that there's a negative right here, when we talk about resting, when we talk about a membrane potential, where the number you see is going to be just along the inside of the plasma membrane. Because remember, just along the inside at a resting state will be negative. So this minus 85 millivolts, so here's our voltmeter, here's the electrode, 
it sticks through the plasma membrane and it's reading the voltage here on the inside. You might see minus 85, you might see minus 95 millivolts, roughly the same thing, okay? All right. <clears throat> so that negative 85 millivolts is the resting membrane potential, meaning the cytosol is 85 millivolts more negative than the extracellular fluid. That's what that means, okay? So resting, key point here, resting membrane potential is when we talk about the membrane potential, it's gonna be the electrode reading from the inside of the cell, and resting will be negative because it's not actively contracting. So resting means a non-contracting, non-excited muscle cell, okay? All right. And in resting conditions, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. All right. So. Now, and remember, this is a concept back from the early chapters, ions. Ions are positively charged, or they can be positively charged, they can be negatively charged, but ions hold a charge. And although they are small, because they're just atoms, although they are small, they cannot just freely pass through the plasma membrane because this hydrophobic barrier right here. Charged things are hydrophilic. This bilayer is hydrophobic, so ions cannot just freely pass. What do they need if they want to pass the plasma membrane? What do they need to do that? They need proteins, integral transmembrane proteins, so that they can pass the plasma membrane. All right, so ion, so electrical charges cross the plasma membrane. Uh, they have to rely on ion channels and a rusting membrane potential. So in order for electrical charges to cross the plasma membrane, we need two things. We need ion channels or protein channels to allow them to pass. And then we need a resting membrane potential for a driving force. So if these ions, positive and negative charges, were equally distributed on both sides of the plasma membrane, even if we had protein carriers here, they wouldn't pass if there's not some sort of gradient for them to dr that driving force to make them want to move okay so that's what that means it rely they rely the movement of ions will rely on protein channels present but then also a potential driving force for them to want a gradient setup for them to move say so i so ion channels ions cannot diffuse cannot diffuse freely through the lipid uh, plasma membrane so they have to rely on protein channels Here's, this is some terminology, and you should be familiar with this. If you hear the term leak channels, leak meaning it allows for leakage. These protein channels are always open, so they continuously allow ions to go into and out of, so switch between the cytosol and the extracellular fluid, and they will move um, you know, either at an equal rate into and out of, or one way or the other if there is a gradient present. So leak channels are always open. Gated channels are protein channels that are closed at rest but open in response to a specific stimulus. So gated channels will only open if a specific stimulus occurs. And there are different types of gated channels that depend on different types of stimuli. So that's this next bullet point down here. Here are some examples of gated ion channels. Ligand gated channels. What is a ligand? It's a substrate that binds. So a ligand gated channel will only open in response to a specific chemical or ligand, so just some sort of substrate that's going to bind to a receptor. So we call these ligand gated channels, you can interchangeably, like usually you'll hear them referred to as like receptors, but it's a protein channel that binds, a they're highly specific because they'll have binding sites for very specific molecules. And only when those specific molecules bind, do they open. That's a ligand gated channel. It relies on a specific substrate or a ligand to bind. Voltage gated channels, it's in its name. It relies on a voltage change. So if a voltage change happens, those gates open, those protein channels open. 
mechanically gated channels. So these are protein channels that will open or close in response to mechanical stimulation. So for example, pressure, stretch, or even vibration. All right, so pressure, these are like touch receptors. So depression, pressure, stretch will open these channels and allow ions to pass. That's what mechanically gated means. So this is terminology that you should be familiar with. And it will help you in muscle physiology and nervous system physiology. So the hydrophobic phospholipid bilayer of any plasma membrane is impermeable to ions. We've said that multiple times. Ions cannot freely pass unless there are protein channels present. Sodium and potassium movement through the sarcolemma is dependent upon protein channels. They will only cross by diffusion if a gradient exists across, across a membrane, all right? So not only do we need protein channels present to allow these ions to pass, but we also need a gradient present to drive the movement of ions across the plasma membrane. I've said that multiple times too. So concentration gradients, oh, so how are these concentration gradients maintained? If you remember back from those early chapters, we talked about active and passive transport. And primary active transport, one of the uh, examples that all books talk about is the sodium-potassium pump. And it's active transport because it relies on the hydrolysis of ATP to drive it. But that sodium potassium pump, oh my God, it is so vitally important for muscle physiology as well as nervous system physiology because that sodium potassium pump sets up the resting membrane potential for excitable cells. Muscles will not be able to be excited and contract unless there is this sodium, these sodium potassium pumps to set up the gradient. Same thing with neurons. Right, so this guy is super duper important. All right, and this is something you should know. This sodium potassium pump will pump three sodiums out for every two, sorry, the pump moves three sodium out for every two potassium in. So what does the sodium potassium pump do? It pumps three sodium out for every two potassium in. All right, so just take note, sodium is positively charged and it just has a positive, so that means plus one. Potassium also has a positive, this means plus one. All right, so we're talking about the movement of ions and setting up a positive gradient outside and a negative gradient inside, but these are both positive ions. So how does that work? I'll get to that, okay? All right, so this pump, Sodium potassium pump moves three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. And it does this by hydrolyzing ATP. So this is active transport. It requires ATP to do this. But what's one of the really important reasons for making ATP? For your cells to do this, among lots of other metabolic reactions. All right, so ATP hydrolysis is necessary because the pump moves ions against their concentration gradient. So these pumps continuously pump three sodiums out where there are already lots of sodiums for every two potassiums in where there are already lots of potassiums. So we're moving ions against their gradients and so it requires ATP. So this is a concept back from those for that first exam. The sodium potassium pump creates a higher concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid and the inside remains lower. So where, this is something you should know, where is there a higher concentration of sodium ions? The outside, the extracellular fluid. Where is the higher concentration of potassium ions? Inside of the cell, in the cytosol. All right, so you should know that. All right, ion channels and gradients. So this is just showing you an image. This is, you know, this picture is taken back from those early chapters all along the sarcolemma, like all along the sarcolemma, you find lots and lots of sodium potassium pumps. Again, it relies on the hydrolysis of ATP, so this is a form of active transport. It requires energy. Why? Because it's moving three sodium in purple, three sodium outside, where there are already lots of sodiums, so against their concentration gradient. For every two potassium inside, 
where there are already more potassiums against its concentration gradient. Now just think logically, yes, they are both positively charged ions. So how is it that we get negative on the inside? One of the reasons is because we have, look, the sodium potassium pump is pumping three sodiums out, so that's plus three, for two potassiums in, that's plus two. So there is a greater pos movement of positive charges outside of the cell, making the outside more positive. All right, so more positive charges moving on the to the outside, fewer positive charges moving to the inside. There's a, so the sarcolemma has millions of these pumps and they maintain this super steep concentration gradient of sodium outside and potassium inside, which is vital to muscle contraction. Gradients are critical. They're a driving force for, that, for the diffusion of sodium and potassium through those membrane channels. And it is only when we get the movement of those ions that we can have our skeletal muscle cells be excited. So it is essential for this resting membrane potential of more sodium out and more potassium in, that is, it's essential to have this resting membrane potential to be able to trigger a muscle contraction. So the concentration gradient is a main factor that de de determines the movement of uncharged solutes. Okay, so when we're think when so what this bullet point is saying is that uncharged solutes like carbon dioxide and glucose and oxygen, the main driving force or the only thing we're really worried about to get the movement is a concentration gradient. How much of carbon dioxide or glucose or oxygen is outside versus inside? Which way is it going to move based on a concentration gradient? Now for ions, ions are charged. So there, it's, the movement of ions is a little more complicated. It's not only affect, the movement of ions will not only be affected by the concentration gradient, just meaning how much is on one side versus the other, but it, the, the electrical gradient also determines the movement, all right? So is there a charge gradient present for the movement along with a concentration gradient present for the movement? So diffusion of ions across plasma membranes is determined by both a concentration gradient as well as an electrical gradient. This is termed an electrochemical gradient. So ions, the movement of ions is dependent upon an electrochemical gradient, meaning is there an electrical gradient for the movement, a difference in charges, and is there a chemical gradient, meaning concentration difference for the movement? So the concentration gradient for potassium. So now we're gonna focus on talking about potassium because it's a little more complicated. And the reason for that is because there are potassium leak channels. Leak, what are leak channels? Go back to here. Leak channels are always open meaning continuously allowing ions to go back and forth between the ECF and the cytosol. And a, a specific type of leak channel that we find in the sarcolemma, but also in neurons, are potassium leak channels. All right, so, oh, wait, sorry, went too far. Okay, so now we're, let's talk about potassium. Concentration gradient for potassium favors diffusion into the extracellular fluid. Why? Well, because the sodium potassium pump pumps lots of potassium inside. So the concentration gradient will be potassium wanting to go from the inside to the outside. The electrical gradient favors movement of potassium into the cytosol or into the cell. Why? Because there's a negative charge, there's negative inside of the cell, positive outside of the cell. Potassium ions are positive, so the electrical gradient is for potassium, which is inside and has a positive charge. The electrical gradient is for it to stay inside, right? The positive charge, the positively charged potassium will be attracted to the negative charge on the inside. But the concentration gradient is driving will want to drive potassium to the outside because there is higher potassium inside versus outside. I'm going to say that again. 
So the electrical gradient will want to keep potassium in because the positively charged potassium is attracted to the negatively charged inside. Opposite charges attract. But the concentration gradient is higher potassium in, lower potassium out, so the concentration gradient wants to drive potassium out. Potassium will want to move from the outside to the inside. All right, so keep that in mind. All right, so overall, the electrical chemical gradient is the sum of the two forces. Electrochemical gradient is the sum of the two forces, both the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient. Whichever is stronger, that is where we'll have the movement of the ions. So if the forces are equal, meaning that the electrical, chemical, the electrical gradient and the concentration gradient are equal, then there would be no movement. Potassium would just, there would just be, you know, just equal movement into and out of, there would be no net movement of potassium. But it just so happens that the concentration gradient for potassium is slightly stronger than the electrical gradient. Net electrical gradient is small, is the small force that draws potassium into the extracellular fluid. So what that means, is that the concentration gradient for potassium is slightly, just a little bit stronger than the electrical gradient. So if the concentration gradient is just a little stronger than the electrical gradient, where is potassium gonna move? It will, a little bit of it, will move, follow its concentration gradient. So a little bit of potassium will leak to the extracellular fluid, all right? Because remember, where is potassium concentration higher? On the inside of the cell and the concentration gradient is slightly stronger than the electrical gradient, so potassium will leak out. All right, okay, so that's what that means. Um, but there is an electrical gradient which draws potassium, all right, so helps ensure the cell doesn't lose too many through the, uh, through too many potassium through the leak channels. <clears throat> so the, what, what that's saying, okay, is that the concentration gradient is only slightly stronger than the electrical, electrical gradient. So yes, a little bit of potassium will leak outside, but at a certain point, potassium will be drawn back in. This just ma makes sure that the cells don't lose too much potassium. All right, so the concentration gradient is only slightly stronger than the electrical gradient. I'm not going to really key point here, <laughs> what I want, the take home message from this is that I want you to understand what an electrical chem, electrochemical gradient is. It factors both factors in both the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient. When do we have to factor in an electrical gradient? When we're talking about ions, because ions have charges. What's the take home message for down here? There are potassium leak channels. And because the concentration gradient for potassium is just slightly stronger, not really strong, just slightly stronger than the electrical gradient, some potassium will leak out into the extracellular fluid, but not enough to make, not enough to where the cell will lose too many because potassium will be eventually pulled back in to follow its electrical gradient. But there are potassium leak channels present. All right, so that's why potassium is leaky. All right, so it's showing the concentration gradient favors the movement of potassium into the extracellular fluid. Here's those leak channels. They're always open. There's a higher concentration of potassium inside versus outside. What sets that up? The sodium potassium pump. So the concentration gradient drives the movement out, but the electrical gradient drives the movement back in. So we only lose a little bit of potassium because the concentration gradient is only slightly stronger than the electrical gradient. All right, so sodium. Let's talk about sodium because that's the other really important ion in muscle physiology is another one. Uh, so sodium, also positively charged, plus one, the sodium concentration gradient favors the movement of sodium ions into the cytosol. That's because that sodium potassium pump pumps three sodium out 
for every two potassium in. So three sodium out for two potassium in. The electrical gradient also favors their movement into the cytosol. So remember, the inside of the cell is negative. Sodium are positively charged ions. So if it wants, to, if it follows, so there's a, there's a, think about it. Let me go back to this slide. Uh, back here, okay. Positive on the outside, negative on the inside. So if we have a higher concentration of sodium ions outside, that means versus inside. So more sodium out, less sodium in. So there's a concentration gradient for sodium to want to come in. There's also an electrical gradient to make sodium want to come in because sodiums are positive. It's positive outside, it's negative inside, opposite charges attract, so we have two forces driving sodium in, or wanting to drive sodium in. The concentration gradient of sodium, more sodium out. Also, there's a negative charge on the inside, so there are two forces that want to pull sodium into the cell. Okay, This creates a strong electrochemical gradient that draws sodium into the cytosol but there's a plasma membrane barrier. So the only way, so there is a really strong electrochemical gradient that wants to pull sodium, drive sodium into the cell, but it will only, sodium will only move into the cell if protein channels open. All right, there are, there are no leak sodium channels. There are leak potassium channels, but there are not leak sodium channels. So only when sodium channels open, will sodium rush into the cell and there is a strong electrochemical gradient that drives this because we have two forces driving it in a concentration gradient as well as an electrical gradient so key takeaway here is that there is a strong electrochemical gradient for sodium to want to rush into the cytosol but it can only rush into the cytosol if protein channels are open all right so generation of a resting membrane potential. To get to a resting state, the membrane potential must become more negative. All right, so to get to, remember, resting state, resting membrane potential is where we have a negative on the inside, positive on the outside. You already learned that earlier in this video. To, so now these next couple of slides just talk about how do we get to that point. We've already talked about one component. That's the sodium-potassium pump. So how do we get to the resting membrane potential where it's positive on the outside and negative 85 on the inside? For a membrane potential to become more negative on the inside, that's where we always measure. Membrane potentials are always measured on the inside. The cell must lose more positive charges than it gains. Ion electrical, electrochemical gradients favor the diffusion of potassium out of the cell and sodium into the cell. More potassium must leave the cell than sodium enter occurs, all right, so this is saying that we have to have more positive charges leaving than coming in. Remember that we have potassium leak channels. So that means, and there is a concentration gradient that's stronger than the electrical gradient that's going to drive potassium out. Just It's not a strong gradient, but it's there. So potassium will leak out. That leakage of potassium, the leakage of positively charged potassium ions out, uh, makes the inside slightly more negative because sodium cannot come in. There are no sodium leak channels, but there are potassium leak channels. More potassium must leave the cell than sodium enters. There are no sodium leak channels, there are only potassium leak channels. Occurs because potassium flow through those leak channels happens more easily than sodium. There are no sodium leak channels. So potassium leaves, that means positively charged ions, potassium ions leave, helps leave behind a more negative resting, a more negative potential outside along with the fact that we have a sodium potassium pump which pumps three positively charged ions out the sodium 
for only two potassium positively charged ions in. That also helps set up more positives on the inside, a long, or sorry, more positive on the outside, excuse me, more positive on the outside, and then also potassium leaks to the outside, making the inside more negative, okay? All right, so this is just a simple little two uh, slides that show you that concept. So imagine there are equal distribution of positives and negatives on the outside versus the inside. One, two, three, four, five, so that's plus five, one, two, three, four, five. It's negative five, neutral. Inside, one, two, three, four, five, plus five. One, two, three, four, five. Negative five, neutral on the inside as well. So no net charges on the outside or inside. But there are potassium leak channels. So if a potassium leak channel is present, potassium is one of those positively charged ions potassium leaks out. That's just one. One potassium leaks out. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six positively charged ions. One, two, three, four, five, negative five. Simple addition with negative numbers, right? We have plus six, a negative five. That leaves a plus one charge on the outside. Inside, we lost a positive charge to the outside, so now we only have one, two, three, four, plus four. Negatives, we have one, two, three, four, five, negative five. What's negative five plus, uh, plus four? It's a negative one charge. That is how positively charged ions can set up a negatively charged membrane potential. And then here's a video that just reiterates that. Welcome back. You've been reading about the resting membrane potential of a neuron, and you've seen that it's a negative voltage. But this negative voltage is actually due to the movement of positive ions. So how is this possible? Let's take a closer look and see if we can give you a boost by explaining how the movement of positive ions can create a negative resting membrane potential. To understand how the resting membrane potential is generated, first we need to look at the distribution of sodium ions and potassium ions across the plasma membrane. As you've seen before, cells have a pump called the sodium-potassium ion pump in their plasma membranes, which pumps sodium and potassium ions across the membrane against their concentration gradients. Now remember that any time we are going against a gradient, it takes an external energy source, and the source here is ATP hydrolysis. For every ATP split into an ADP and a phosphate, the pump drives three sodium ions out of the cell, while bringing two potassium ions into the cell. What this does is create a very strong concentration gradient for these ions. There is a high concentration of sodium ions outside the cell and a low concentration inside the cell. The reverse is true for potassium ions. We have a lot inside the cell, but few outside the cell. You should know that. Where is sodium highest? Where is potassium highest? Why? What sets that up? the sodium-potassium pump. You've learned about different types of protein channels in the plasma membrane, and one example is the leak channel, which is a channel that is always open. The plasma membrane has a number of different types of leak channels, and in particular has a lot of potassium ion leak channels. We know from our study of diffusion that one of the forces that will drive potassium ions through leak channels is their concentration gradient. That is, they will move from inside the cell, where we have a large number of potassium ions, to outside the cell, where we have far fewer. That's the concentration gradient that potassium wants to follow. So now how does all of this apply to a resting membrane potential? Well, the thing to keep in mind about a membrane potential is that it relies on the difference in charge across the membrane. These charges depend on the distribution of positively 
and negatively charged ions across the membrane. Notice here that the number of positive and negative charges on both sides of the membrane are the same. There are five positive and five negative charges on each side. This means there's no charge difference. Since there's no charge difference, there's no membrane potential. And no membrane potential means no, the cell can't be excitable. So in order for a skeletal muscle cell or a neuron in the nervous system, in order for a skeletal muscle cell to be excitable, there has to be a membrane potential, an electrical gradient that will drive a, a conduction of an impulse, okay? So this setting up of a resting membrane potential is critical for cells to be excitable, for skeletal muscle cells to be excitable. So in order to actually create a membrane potential, we need to move some ions around so that they are distributed unequally. Let's say we let one potassium ion follow its gradient and exit the cell through a leak channel. Notice that now outside the cell we have six positive charges and five negative charges for a total of positive one. Inside the cell, we have five negative charges but only four positive charges giving us a total of negative one. So the cell has lost one positive charge and the extracellular fluid has gained one. As a result, we have a charge difference. The inside is negative one, the outside positive one. And so now we have generated a membrane potential. So that's one way that we, so along the sodium potassium pump, along with these potassium leak channels, helps set up a membrane potential where there's more negative on the inside, positive on the outside. That's how we get a resting membrane potential of around negative 85, because remember, we're measuring just on the inside of this plasma membrane. Another factor that this, uh, these PowerPoint slides don't uh, go into is the fact that uh, inside of the cell, we also have proteins, and these, pr these proteins cannot just pass through the plasma membrane, so they're impermeable. And a lot of proteins have a, a net negative charge to them. So along with these leak channels and sodium potassium pumps, impermeable negatively charged proteins inside of the cell contribute to a negative on the inside, positive on the outside. To generate the resting membrane potential, this happens of course on a much larger scale with millions of potassium ions leaking out of the cell causing the cytosol to constantly lose positive charges. We represent this by showing a line of positive charges on the ECF side of the membrane and a line of negative charges on the cytosolic side of the membrane. Overall, the leakage of potassium ions leads to a resting membrane potential of about negative 70 millivolts, which indicates that the inside of the cell is about 70 millivolts more negative than the outside of the cell. All right, so resting membrane potential. That is how the electrical gradient is set up, the electrical potential is set up at rest. What is an action potential? So the a an action potential is going to be a brief change in the membrane potential of the cell from that resting negative value to a positive value and then back. So it's a brief change. We go from negative to positive, back to negative. So resting to positive, back to resting. It's generated by the opening and closing of sodium and potassium channels in the plasma membrane in response to a stimulus. So these gated sodium, so there are leak potassium channels we've already talked about, but what we haven't talked about yet are gated sodium channels and gated potassium channels. And these guys will only open in response to a specific stimulus. So when that specific stimulus occurs, we can have the generation of an action potential by the opening of these gated channels. Mem the, during an action potential, the membrane will experience a rapid and dramatic change in movement of sodium and potassium. And when there's a movement of sodium and a, a rapid and dramatic movement of sodium and potassium, this alters the membrane potential and it produces an action potential.
So key takeaway here is that an action potential is a brief, rapid, and dramatic change in the movement of sodium and potassium. When does an action potential occur? It, it happens in response to a stimulus. All right, that's a key takeaway there. All right, so some terminology that you should be familiar with. It helps you with muscle physiology. It also helps you with nervous system physiology. An action potential occurs in two main stages, depolarization and repolarization. Depolarization begins when voltage-gated sodium channels. So voltage-gated means that a voltage change has to occur in order for these channels to open. The fact that it's a voltage-gated sodium channel means that only sodium ions will flow through it. So depolarization begins when voltage-gated sodium channels open and sodium flows inward. That's down its concentration gradient from high to low, but also following it's an electrical gradient because it's negative on the inside. So sodium really rushes in because it has both concentration and electrical gradients driving it. So sodium really rushes in and makes, so if you have a rapid inward flow of positively charged ions, what's gonna happen to the inside of the cell? It's going to become more, less negative, more, po more positive. That's depolarization, where the inside of the cell becomes less negative or more positive. The membrane potential quickly reaches zero millivolts and peaks at approximately positive 30. So here, this diagram, this cartoon is showing resting state where we have more sodium outside, less sodium inside, more potassium inside, less potassium outside, resting around minus 90, minus 85-ish, somewhere around there, so resting. And then we have some sort of stimulus. So here are our gated sodium, voltage-gated sodium channels. Some sort of stimulus is received and it opens the gate. Well now, okay, now there's an avenue for sodium to move and there's a concentration gradient driving it in. There's also an electrical gradient driving it in. So sodium really rushes into the cell following both its concentration and electrical gradient. And that's why we see this super steep. So look at our axes. This is over time along the X axis the y-axis, this is the millivolt, the membrane potential in millivolts. Negative, zero, to more positive. What's happening during this depolarization stage? Sodium is rushing in, making the inside of the cell less negative, more positive. And it reaches about plus 30 millivolts, all right? And at that point, when it reaches plus 30 millivolts, these, these voltage-gated sodium channels are inactivated. And when they are inactivated, no more sodium can come in. That's why it peaks right here and it stops. If it didn't close or inactivate, then we would just keep going up until there's no more sodium rushing in. But it closes or inactivates. Then this plus 30 millivolts will actually cause voltage-gated potassium channels to open. So look, this plus 30 membrane potential opens the voltage, so that's the voltage that opens these voltage-gated potassium channels. So when this opens, what's where's potassium gonna wanna move? Potassium's gonna wanna follow its concentration gradient. It's gonna move out from the inside to the outside of the cell. And that's why we see the membrane potential going back down, it's becoming repolarized because it's becoming more negative again, right? We're moving down towards these, towards these negative numbers. Why is it not as steep as the depolarization stage? Repolarization is not as steep and that's because there isn't, remember those leak channels, those potassium leak channels? Potassium's already leaking to the outside so there's not as there's not as strong of a driving force for potassium to want to rush out. Whereas there's a huge driving, a really strong driving force for sodium to rush in, super steep, 
there's not as strong as a driving force for potassium out, so during repolarization, it's not as steep. And then eventually, when we get back down to resting membrane potential, voltage-gated potassium channels open, and then we can maintain resting again because those sodium-potassium pumps are constantly working. Those leak channels are constantly open. These gated, voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium channels are not always open. They only open in response to a specific stimulus. So muscle fibers, muscle cells, exhibit conductivity. Electrical charges can cross the sarcolemma. These action potentials are not isolated events. When it happens here, so imagine um, skeletal muscle cells are really, really long. So this plasma membrane extends all the way. This action potential happens here, and then the voltage changes here, open channels over here. And then the voltage changes here, open channels over here. And so these action potentials are not isolated events, but rather they are conducted or propagated along the entire length of the sarcolemma. So think of it as like ripples on a surface of a pond. If you drop something, if there's a stimulus in one area of the pond, like dropping a rock, the ripples don't just stay to that isolated area of where the rock was dropped into it. Those ripples extend through the surface of the pond, it's just like an action potential. And that's because that of that, conduct, that conductivity property. So the, that action potential is sent down the entire length of the sarcolemma. The process is super duper fast. And remember that the, the sarcolemma, that plasma membrane, dips down into structures called T-tubules. So the action potential also propagates along those T-tubules. And it's the arrival of this action potential at the T-tubule that initiates muscle contraction. Remember, what is sandwiched on the outside of those T-tubules? The terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What are the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? They are special structures of this. Okay, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is pretty much like smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What do they do? They store calcium. And it is when the action potential arrives at those T tubules that it stimulates the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to dump calcium. And when calcium gets dumped, into the cytosol, then we can have muscle contraction.